And while they're heading out, please take out your Bibles and turn to Matthew 5. First book of the New Testament, Matthew 5, as we consider part 2 of Jesus' definition of murder. <clears throat> and for the context, I'm going to read verses 21 through 26. So please follow along in your Bible. Jesus says, You have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the supreme court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison Truly I say to you, you will not come out of there until you have paid up the last cent. Let's pray. Lord, we ask for your spirit to be our teacher and our guide this morning to reveal to us the truth of your word. Remove all other thoughts, Lord, worldly thoughts, concerns, and may we focus solely on what you have for us this morning. It's in your name that we ask, Lord. Amen. The words here of Jesus are some of the most convicting words that maybe we've heard in the gospel. The righteousness required to enter the kingdom of heaven is vastly beyond what we could ever produce on our own. Jesus is dismantling the pharisaical interpretation that had become the accepted standard. A righteousness that they promoted that was external only, outward. As long as you looked holy, that's what mattered. And it was incomplete because of how they misunderstood what God had intended in verses 21 through 48, there are six examples that Jesus gives where he contrasts the accepted understanding coming from the Pharisees versus his authoritative explanation. Because Jesus, of course, knew the law better than they did. As far as a, a quick review, Jesus affirmed the truthfulness and the authority of God's word in verses 17 through 19. You are not allowed to abolish it or annul it. And he certainly is not doing that with what he is saying. But verse 20 is the key that you need a righteousness that surpasses even the scribes and the Pharisees for you to enter the kingdom of heaven. There is a level of righteousness that God demands that none of us can make on our own, we cannot produce it on our own, and then Jesus goes through these examples to show this is really, if you really wanted to produce your own righteousness, this is what you'd have to do. And for his kingdom citizens, this is what God expects of you. But we're considering his words here on the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. And we hear his words about what true fulfillment is and what our expectation is as being one of his kingdom citizens. There are three requirements needed to fulfill this command in its totality. If you could fulfill all righteousness, you would have to 
fulfill all three of these perfectly. And we saw the first two last time, which is, the first one is in verse 21, which is prohibiting the act of physical murder. That is a definite one we do not want to skip or ignore. The act of physically taking the life of another unlawfully is prohibited by God's law. Prohibiting the act of physical murder. That's what the Pharisees taught. That's what they told their people. And they're certainly not wrong. It is incomplete. Because number two is prohibiting the attitude of intellectual murder. The attitude of intellectual murder. God is always concerned with the heart. And murder is not an isolated act. It begins in the heart. And so God weighs the heart as well. The heart must be righteous also. And if you want to see that, notice verse 22. As Jesus fully explains the command, but I say to you, everyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Guilty before the court, same phrase as verse 21. So both of these in God's court are held to account. And so anger and hatred is equally disobeying the command in God's eyes. And so anger is prohibited. Internal, seething anger that hates another person that maybe doesn't even ever come out. No one will ever even know, but God knows. That kind of angry, seething hatred, but also lesser forms of that. I would include things like annoyance, disgust, complaining. That's all part of it. Jesus tells us that this internal anger, it's not always hidden. And the heart, the status of your heart will bear fruit in your life. And hatred and anger in your heart will bear fruit. It will come out in words, verse 22. And, and so you may say to your brother, you, you good for nothing, you, you empty-headed dimwit. That's the idea there. And that's the form of anger and hatred Jesus is talking about. You're so stupid. But he goes even further... Whoever says you fool shall be guilty enough to go into fiery hell. That is a statement that should be used in evangelism there. If you really think you are a good enough person for heaven, if you've ever called your brother a fool, you stand guilty before God and liable for eternal hell. Such words that we speak reveal the heart of contempt that we have within us. So an angry heart is a form of murder in God's eyes. And so we see the two prohibitions, prohibiting the act, prohibiting the attitude. But there's more, and it's number three, it's pursuing the antidote to relationship murder. This is part of the fulfillment of the command. Pursuing the antidote to relationship murder. Remember what Jesus is doing here. He's not abolishing the law. He's not setting aside. He's not saying, well, don't, you know, just get rid of that. I've got something new to tell you. He's fulfilling it. That's what he said back in verse 17. And, and true fulfillment of the law would include not just the negative side, but the positive side as well. Not just the avoidance of the act of sin, but actually actively participating in the opposite of that sin, which is the righteous behavior. That's not how we think, is it? We think of obedience to God as like, just don't do the negative. That's how we boil it down. If I just don't do the negative, I'm good. And that's how the Pharisees thought. Don't commit murder, never have. Clear. But when parents say to their child, don't fight with your brother, they don't mean just stop punching. They mean get along with your sibling, be agreeable with one another, work together. That's all part of the don't fight. And the same goes with God's commands. Complete righteousness is not about just avoiding the negative. 
It's also doing the positive. There are sins of commission, sins that we commit, things that we do that we're not supposed to do, but there are also sins of omission, which is not doing what you are supposed to do. And so righteousness in God's eyes is two-sided. Yes, you are not to do the negative, but instead you are to do the positive, and both are required. And that's exactly what we read in Colossians 3 earlier, put off and put on, and that's in Ephesians 4 as well. And so Jesus gives two responsibilities here in verses 23 through 26 to make that point, that you must go further than just not doing the negative, you must pursue the opposite. You must pursue the antidote to a murderous situation within relationships with people. You have to seek reconciliation with two parties. And the first thing he says is you need to make peace with your brother. You need to make peace with your brother in verses 23 in 24, if you're presenting your offering at the altar and then you remember your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So Jesus gives this hypothetical situation about worship. Right? If you're presenting your offering, this is an act of worship at the temple. You are there, you are devoted to God, you are doing what God called you to do, what you're supposed to do. You're following the prescribed order of sacrifice. But while you're doing that, while you're going through the motions there, you remember that your brother has something against you, verse 23. There's animosity of some kind. There's a bitter spirit between the two of you. There's an unreconciled relationship. And it seems to be here that Jesus is not talking about some kind of false or made-up grievance. This is a legitimate grievance. You did something to offend or upset your brother whether it was recent or whether it was a while ago. And what must you do, verse 24? Leave your offering before the altar and go. Jesus is showing us the priority, the importance of reconciliation in relationships, in making peace. It's all verbs in verse 24. Leave your offering, go, be reconciled, come and present your offering. It's all actions now. To allow this hatred and angry disposition to continue, you are allowing a murderous temperament within the relationship. And you're allowing that to continue. You're allowing it to move in that direction to where there could be some serious hatred, some serious anger, and possibly even some violence. And so you need to go make peace. It's such a priority to Jesus that he suggests really almost the ridiculous, where someone would scoff at it, leave your offering and go. Remember, Jesus is preaching in Galilee. He's speaking to Galileans. That's about 80 miles from Jerusalem. So if you've gone to Jerusalem to worship in a sacrifice, you've traveled that 80 miles walking. You've gone and purchased your sacrificial animal. You've waited in line. You are patiently trying to do what God called you to do. And he says, leave the animal, abandon it, and go all the way back to Galilee and fix that relationship. Do you see the extreme lengths he's telling us to go to? That would be preposterous. That would take days. That would take weeks. I can't do that. That's too extreme. Jesus would say, no, that's how important it is. That is righteousness. That is the righteous fulfillment of God's expectations. And that's how important it is to God. Without reconciliation, hostility festers, dislike, resentment, opposition, anger. And all that kind of stuff in the church is absolutely disastrous. And using the words that Jesus used, I would say it murders the unity of God's people. It's not just disastrous in the church, it's disastrous in families, friendships, co-workers. 
And so making peace is extremely important to squash the possibility of anger arriving and then growing. And it's so important to God, he prioritizes it above worship. I mean, did you notice that? He doesn't say, you finish your offering, and then the first thing you do is go reconcile. He doesn't say that. And even some might have that thought, well, let me just, let me just worship God, and then I'll go fix that problem I have with my brother. I mean, God comes first, right? Jesus is saying, no, you need to go fix it now. You know why? Because the, worshiping, the worship that you're offering is false worship, and God does not hear it. It's not accepted by God. How can you worship God and sacrifice to him and sing about forgiveness and how he has reconciled me to himself, and all the while you are unreconciled with people you've offended? That worship is false. It is meaningless. It is unheard by God. So he wants you to go take care of this first. And you know what? You need to go fix it. The responsibility is on the offending party. Right? Notice verse 23. You remember that your brother has something against you. You go because you're the one that did it. You don't sit back and say, well, if he's upset, that's on him. You don't sit back and say, you know what, when I run into him, I'll say sorry. You go fix it. What heartache and division in the church and in families could have been prevented by people seeing the priority of reconciliation? Now let me ask you something. Are, are you coming to church every Sunday offering to God unreceived worship because you are unreconciled with your brother. Go make peace. This is what God expects of his people. Pursue the antidote to this kind of heart murder that takes place. Fix it. And let me just point out one Last thing here. Go back to verse 24. Go first, be reconciled to your brother, and then what? And then come and present your offering. Listen, God still gets his glory. You come back and worship because God deserves that. But you fix the relationship first. What we must do is clear, is it not? Jesus is not confusing here. The question is, will we go do it? Make peace with your brother. But you know what? There's more. Jesus says, secondly here, make peace with your opponent. The surpassing righteousness that is required for heaven is truly incredible. Jesus says, go make peace with your opponent. I mean, making peace with your friends, that's easy, right? Making peace with your opponent? Notice verse 25. Make friends... Quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and you be thrown into prison. This seems to be some kind of official infraction that Jesus is referring to. This isn't a personality disagreement. This isn't a personal offense. This is a legal thing. This is a court issue. And, and looking at the words of Jesus, it seems to be some kind of financial issue as he says, uh, at the end of verse 26, you will pay the last cent. So this is a legal thing. You owe someone money, or maybe you have an unpaid debt, or you had some contract or agreement, and you didn't go through with it, and now you are liable for what you didn't do, and you're not paying. And so this opponent is taking you to court to get what is rightfully his. And so he is your opponent in that he is your accuser in court. Someone has brought formal charges against you. And Jesus says, you know what you need to do? You need to make peace. 
That's what verse 25 means. Make friends quickly. Be agreeable. Make it a favorable situation. Another way to say it, resolve this. Don't, don't hide behind a lawyer. Don't hide behind legal loopholes. Make it right. And do it urgently. Because both of these examples he gives speaks to the urgency of reconciliation that is needed. Notice verse 25. Make peace with him while you're with him on the way. Like what? You're on your way to court. This is before we even get to the legal proceedings. Make peace. Like he said earlier, leave your offering and go do it now. Here he says, do it quickly. Do it on the way. Don't wait for the courts to settle it. Go make it right. Why? Because this is pursuing the antidote to relationship murder. Don't, give, don't even give the opportunity for anger and bitterness and hatred to begin to to fester and to begin to separate. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to take steps to prevent that from happening. That's righteousness. The illustration that Jesus uses here is the, the typical procedure for handling this. You go to court, you go before the judge, the issue is settled, and then you're punished. And so it's clear here that you are, just like the first example, you are the guilty party. You are the offending party. You are responsible. And so it is on you to make it right. But this is an illustration that involves a bigger principle as well. This, this deals with, in finality, when we will stand before God and we will answer to Him. That's the idea of being thrown into prison, verse 25, but then you won't come out of there until you've paid the last cent. It's like, wait, how, how can I go to prison and then pay off my debt at the same time? That doesn't make sense. How could I pay off what I owe if I'm locked away? He's making a comparison to God's uh, judgment and God's punishment. If you are in the wrong, you need to go make it right because don't think some kind of legal delay or some kind of legal loophole will exempt you from God's perfect justice. Everything will be accounted for in God's court. You better believe every last cent, every penny. And so these two responsibilities, they show our need to go further than just, I won't do something, I will do the opposite, the positive side of the command. Don't murder, don't hate, okay. But even more than that, pursue reconciliation, pursue peace. This is the kind of effort that, that makes peace out of adversarial relationships whether it be a brother offended or an opponent who's owed. Now, sometimes you can't reconcile because the relationship is too damaged. Maybe you reach out and they will not speak to you or they refuse to. They won't hear you out. Even to ask forgiveness, the Bible says in, in Romans, as far as it is possible with you, be at peace with all men. You do everything on your part. And we understand, right? Peace with a brother, I get that. Peace with an opponent? Jesus, you're really making this hard. And you know what Jesus is going to say a little later on? This is nothing new. Go down to verse 43 and 44. You know, love your enemies. Is this really that radical? Is this something unique that God said? Imagine the situation in the church or in the family or in society if God's word was actually followed by people. If peace was pursued. But this is part of the point, friends. This is what Jesus is doing is that he, he's showing us that God's standard of righteousness is perfection. Verse 48, read that. And we are always left... We are always found wanting. We, we cannot fulfill what you've required, Lord. And so what he get, does is he, he gives forgiveness. We seek mercy and forgiveness, not self-justification. As we realize that Jesus 
Well, the Word of God says, 1 Corinthians 6, Revelation, murderers do not enter the kingdom of God. And friends, it's even the, the hateful are those who are guilty of murder. And so we don't come to God saying, God, look at all I have done to fulfill your commands. We come to God with empty hands saying, God, I can't do it. I need you to do it for me. I need you to give it to me because I could never do it on my own. And that's what he does. But for you and I as kingdom disciples here, we're given our instruction. There is a level of righteousness that you are called to, isn't it? Now, with the remaining part of our time, I want to switch gears. I want to do something a little different. Because I really want to consider and diagnose anger and what it is. I can assume that no one here has engaged in the actual act of murder. If you have, you need to go turn yourself in. But we've all engaged in the attitude of murder, haven't we? Anger, hatred, lashing out. So we need help with dealing with the problem of anger biblically. And the first thing we need to do to help us with the problem of anger is to correctly understand it, because it's a major problem. Well, one one known, uh, well-known Christian counselor says he estimates about 90% of all counseling problems involve some kind of sinful anger. Remember, there's righteous anger and there's sinful anger. The Bible says be angry, but don't sin. So righteous anger is when we are upset at sin, and we are upset at evil, and how evil is prospering, and, and we respond appropriately to that. The Bible says that God is angry with sinners. Jesus was angry with the hypocritical Pharisees who got mad that he healed somebody because he did it on the wrong day. Jesus was angry when they turned God's house of worship into a place of commerce. Paul was angry when he went into the the city of Athens and it was full of idols and there was all this idolatry going on. He was angry at that. That's righteous. That's godly anger. But most anger is not that. Most anger is sinful anger. And sinful anger is when we're angry at the wrong things for the wrong reasons and we express it in the wrong ways. A lot of people talk about their anger as being something that controls them. And so there's various expressions of anger, resentment, bitterness, irritation, grumbling, complaining, sarcasm, indifference, criticism, a hyper kind of competitiveness, I got to be better than you, physical abuse, envy, hatred, quarrels, fighting, sulking, yelling, abusive words, all of that. We would all agree, right, though that is not righteous anger. So we need to work to confront and deal with anger in our lives. And, and what is anger? I mean, what is it? If you were to turn to secular understandings of anger, they would, they would call it and they would describe it as a thing within us, a, a something inside of us, something maybe foreign to our, our being, but almost like a substance or a fluid. There's a presence of this thing called anger inside of me, and sometimes it boils up. You ever use that phrase? It's, it's boiling up, or it's pent up, or it's ready to explode, or i got to get it off my chest. And, and all of that describes anger like some kind of pressurized substance within us, and we got to just m- make sure the levels are okay. And so the solutions to anger vary, but it's always just fixing the symptoms. Like some, some say, well, you need to express your anger in a healthy way. You ever heard that? Anger is good, says the world. Just express it rightly. Some people say that you need to vent your anger. You ever heard that? Go punch this pillow. Go scream and shout in the woods. Let it out. Uh, Some advocate relaxation techniques, you know, calm down, count to five, woosah, whatever you got to do. Suppress it as much as possible. So I'm like, what is it? Is it let it out or hold it down? Which one should I do? The Bible doesn't treat anger like a thing, friends. The Bible treats anger like this. It's a moral act. It's a behavior. It's our sinful response or reaction to situations and people. That's biblically what anger is. So the biblical solution to anger is not to vent it. The biblical solution to anger is to repent of it and turn to God for grace in help conquering it. The Bible says that anger 
is already present within us. It's present in our heart. And anger comes out. The source of anger is desire. It's wants. It's lust. If you don't believe me, turn to the book of James. James chapter 4. James diagnoses every quarrel and conflict in the world. James 4, 1 and 2. You have it there on your note sheet. You can always look it up at another time. But James says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Isn't the source your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust, and you don't have. Here's where it connects to the Sermon on the Mount. So you commit murder. You're envious, and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. So James says the source of all quarrels and conflicts is you have an internal desire or pleasure or want that you're not getting. And we all have wants, and we all have things we desire, and we want those so bad that when we are denied or restricted those things that we want, we respond with what? Anger. So the issue of anger is not a substance that's boiling up. The issue is pride. I'm not getting what I want, and I'm upset about that, and things should be going my way. 2 Peter 1 says that there is corruption in the world, and it is due to lust. Most of the world's problems can be boiled down to desire, lust, wants. Just things that are not fulfilled. And sometimes those things are legitimate, and sometimes they're good. Like, I want to be on time for my job, but traffic is preventing me. I have a good desire, or I want to be treated with respect, but my, my spouse is not doing that. Th that desire is good, friends, but what happens is that desire becomes so strong that it becomes I must have it. And when I don't get it, I'm willing to sin to get it. And so it becomes my priority. It becomes the number one thing in my life. It becomes my idol. It becomes what I worship. It's more important to me than obeying God. And so I give it priority above all. And so it's idolatry. My desires, my wants, my pleasures become the most important thing for me. And if you won't give it to me, then I will respond to you in anger. And angry people learn that if they express their anger, they usually get results. Usually he's so angry all the time, just give him what he wants. And that feeds more anger. So what you need to do when you start to feel angry is you need to ask yourself, what is it that I want so much? What am I not getting? It makes us think of God's question to Jonah. Do you remember Jonah? The amazing revival that happened in Nineveh. All these people get saved. It's a wonderful, glorious thing. Hallelujah. Praise God. And it says Jonah was angry. And God asked Jonah, Jonah, do you have a good reason to be angry? Because all sinful anger is ultimately directed at God. It is. Because he controls all the details of our lives. So irritation and fighting and complaining and shouting, it's all pointed at him. You may think it's not, but it is. In essence, you're saying, I don't like the way you run my life, God. I don't like the, your direction and your rule right now. I don't like what you're bringing before me. I should have what I want. And so you think what God says, do you have good reason to be angry? To treat anger, we have to go to the source. We can't treat the symptoms. The world says, vent your anger. God says, that's murder. Don't do that. Relaxation techniques. That's just going to have it come back. Addressing the heart of anger. We need to think through these personal statements. You have it. Addressing the heart of anger. Number one is, I want something too much. I want something too much. I have desires 
And those are good sometimes. But my angry response is proof of my idolatry. I want this thing too much. And it's become the most important thing to me, so much so that I'm willing to sin to get it. Secondly, I am not God. I don't always get my way. And you know what? It's not my place to put other people in their place. I do not have to correct and make right all the situations of the world. Right? Like, like, you need to be told off. I need to tell you off because you need to be told off. That's God's job. You don't do that. Some people think anger and shouting is legitimate because you need to, you need to put stupid people in their place. That's not my place. I'm not God. Thirdly, I've received grace. I have received grace. God has been so gracious to me, and he continues to be every day, over and over and over again. So my anger at his direction of my life is misplaced and is ungrateful. Do you have good reason to be angry? Fourthly, I must put off anger. It is not something to be involved in or indulged in. And this is the overwhelming testimony of Scripture. I'm going to give you a flurry of verses here. They're all in your notes there at the bottom. Colossians 3, put off anger. Ephesians 4.31, let bitterness and wrath and anger be put away from you. Proverbs 12.16, a fool's anger is known at once. Proverbs 14.29, he who is slow to anger has great understanding. Proverbs 15.1, a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15, 18, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife. Proverbs 22, 24, do not associate with a man given to anger. Someone told me this story just this week about a pastor who was let go because he was just angry all the time. Do not associate with a man given to anger. I must put off anger. It's displeasing, it's sinful, it's wrong, it's destructive. And lastly, fifth there, I can put on righteousness. I can. Through God's spirit and through God's grace, he can transform me and he does that through the word because I'm a new creation in Christ, right? I can exercise self-control and I can speak with kindness and I can show love. I hear people say, oh, I have anger and I just can't control it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can be angry, screaming at your kids and someone from the church calls and immediately you're, hello, right? You can control it real quick. But friends, by God's grace, we don't just control it, we replace it. We replace it with righteousness. Ephesians 4.31 says, let anger and wrath, you know, let all that be put away from you. But then it says, but be kind to one another and tenderhearted and forgive one another. And that is possible through Christ and through his grace. That That transformation from angry to gracious, that is real. And the Lord can do that. And what you have to do just in the moments of anger is you have to stop and you just have to ask yourself some questions like, what's happening? Like, assess the situation. Like, I told my kids to clean up and they're not doing it. Or the the worker was bringing me my drink and they spilt it on my new suit. Okay, that's what's happening. What am, I, what am I not getting? Well, my kids are not obeying me, and that's making me upset. My nice new suit that I paid money for, I don't have anymore. That's what I'm not getting. And so what am I tempted to do? Am I tempted to scream and shout at my kids? Am I tempted to throw my cup across the coffee shop or get the worker in trouble with their boss? That's what I'm tempted to do, but what does the Bible tell me to do? God tells me to speak with kindness to my children The Bible says don't worry about something like a piece of clothing. The Bible says to extend forgiveness. And so in the moment of anger, I have to ask myself, who am I going to obey? Am I going to obey God or am I going to obey myself? I'm tempted to respond this way. God calls on me to behave that way. Who will I obey? Who do I worship? I guess that's time. Okay. It is by God's grace that we can do this. 
His grace even enables us to do the impossible things like love offenders. We can seek reconciliation. We can grant and receive forgiveness. The strongest words you can ever say to someone is not an angry shouting at them. It's the words, will you forgive me? And so anger needs to be repented of. Turn to God in faith that by obedience to his word, sin can be removed and it can be replaced with righteousness. Friends, it will not be easy. There will be failures. But by God's gracious enabling, we can transform, we can replace our anger with righteousness. But this is the total fulfillment of the sixth commandment. Prohibiting the act, prohibiting the attitude, and then pursuing the antidote. And let me tell you something, that's only one command. That's one command. So even if you perfectly obeyed this, there's how many more? We will never, forget, we will never fulfill God's word in our own power. We need his grace and mercy to give us the righteousness we need. But the standard is laid down, isn't it? The expectation for God's kingdom citizens. This is what's expected of you. Next week, we're going to get into verses 27 through 30, where we look at Jesus' instructions regarding adultery and how it goes, again, even further, just things like lust and perversion. Let's pray. God, you call on us to be righteous. You call on us not just to be those that hide their sin or keep it secret, but to replace sin with righteousness. So help us to see your divine standard and how far we fall, Lord, and to plead with you for mercy and grace and forgiveness. Father, we are all murderers in your sight. And we cannot keep your law perfectly. We need Christ to do it for us. And he, he grants us the righteousness needed for heaven. It's a gift. It's not earned. But Lord, we pray for your transfer transformation of all of us who are angry individuals, Lord. To replace anger with kindness, tenderheartedness, love and forgiveness. We can have victory, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing our closing hymn. I don't care if we're past time. Let's go. <clears throat> 82. Victory in Jesus. There is victory. Victory over our sinful tendencies and our sinful behaviors. Let's sing verse 1 together. <clears throat>